I've always felt like there's a bit of a mystique when it comes to Halloween time. It's that time of the year, right between winter and spring, where everything slowly starts to die off, but in a very beautiful and spectacular way. But it also gets cold and desolate, and there's also a lot of rituals around the fall season. And I think that's why we love the Halloween season and put Halloween around that time. It is mysterious, and it's kind of weird, just like horror. And if you were to ask me what film encased everything I love about Halloween season, well, it would be the movie of the same title. Halloween. And on this Halloween season, we're going to look at the actual movie itself, Halloween. No matter how cliche that might be. Now, I'm not going to go into the full history of this movie, mostly because there are people who have done a way better job than I ever could at that. I will say that this essentially started the horror career of John Carpenter, which if you don't know the name, then you will definitely recognize his work, as he was the creative mastermind behind The Thing as well as Escape from New York and one of my personal favorites, They Live. And it's also credited as the first horror movie to be based around a holiday, which you know, it's not Black Christmas was a thing before this. And considering the amount of Christmas-based horror movies, you could argue that one's a lot more influential, but I digress. What it should receive credit for is starting the horror revolution with slasher flicks. Because it was right around this time we got movies like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and a myriad of others. And it's still considered by many to be one of the greatest horror movies ever made. And one idiot ranked it the number one best gateway horror movie ever. So is it worthy of that reputation? Well, yes, short answer is yes, absolutely. But for the long answer, let's keep looking. The movie takes place in suburbia, Illinois, where a little kid has murdered his sister. Then, some odd years later, he breaks out of an asylum during a storm, murders someone to steal his overalls and a mask, and then on Halloween night, tries to finish the job by killing his other sister that survived. And that's basically the story without giving away too much, and while it sounds very simple, well, it is, but that's its beauty. The beauty of most slasher films, at least in my opinion anyway, is that they can be made on the very extreme cheap and have very easy stories. However, that's where they can excel in much other areas like, say, their kills or their characters. Relocating the time you would spend writing into much better ass. Take the original Friday the 13th, for example. It is still very simple with some minor twists here and there. And it's able to switch things up with some very creative kills. And of course, the main selling point is the slasher himself, the main killer of the movie. And you should have had something unique about them. Jason felt like an unreal, unstoppable monster. Freddy Krueger, unlike other slashers, would actually talk and would be a wise ass about it. But the killer of Halloween, Michael Myers, is an interesting case in that the fear isn't the fact that he can't be stopped and he doesn't talk either, so he doesn't have that going for him either. No, what makes Michael Myers so terrifying is that he feels real. Michael isn't built like a tank, he's not a football player, he's built like an average person. But in a genius move, by making Michael Myers average looking, you make him much more scarier. Let me put it to you this way, look at Michael in this movie. Now imagine if someone you knew was under that mask. Your co-worker, or someone you saw at school, or anybody, maybe even a complete stranger. By making Michael average, you can project someone you know onto Michael, giving him the sense that anyone could be him. And to me, by giving him next to no personality and making him a blank slate, you make him more scary than Jason who's a tank or Freddy who can talk. And what helps show this off more are two things. For one, the way he actually kills people, as his kills actually feel very real. This is due to the tight camera work, the awesome stunt coordination, as well as Michael himself. He doesn't kill people with intense strength or just sheer willpower like Jason. Rather instead, his kills are very quick, Swift and secluded, killing, well, exactly as a serial killer would, being quick enough that they can't scream for help, yet at the same time being brutal enough that they can kill him off. Take this scene here, which is considered one of the most iconic and one of my personal favorites, where Jason manages to get the drop on this guy and silence him by pinning him against the wall. He holds him high against the wall and chokes him out so he can't scream for help, and then pulls out his knife, and stabs him in the shoulder, presumably where his jugular would be, not only digging the knife into it hard enough to pin him to it, but also killing him in the process. And then Michael just backs away and examines it like it's an art piece to him. Now, let's break this scene down and explain how this scene alone puts every single aspect of Michael's character into perspective. First opening with someone finding him in the closet and him rushing out to try and pin him against the wall. Watch it closely and notice how he actually staggers a bit to pin him there as if he wasn't expecting it. Then he ends up choking the person out and while it's not graphic, it feels brutal. Like you could actually maybe grasp your throat feeling the sense of life leaving him. Complimented by him kicking the ground as if he's trying to get 
needed some footing. Cutting then back to Michael brandishing the knife, getting ready to deliver the killing blow. His face half in darkness with a somewhat human face thanks to the mask, yet at the same time feels abnormal, complemented by the nice glare of the big kitchen knife he has. Reflecting just the tiniest bit of light onto Michael's face, giving it just enough light that you recognize it's him, while at the same time feeling unnerved that this is human. But is it though? Cutting back to showing the man's life leaving his body before then coming back to Michael as he examines it. Almost like a demented artist admiring a painting he just made, listfully tilting his head side to side as if he feels no remorse or pain in what he's done and yet feels a strange beauty in it. Now notice how when we break this kill down it has layers to it. A simple serial killer movie now has a layered kill to it. One that not only shows off everything we need to know about Michael, but also shows off the amazing filmmaking on display here. The smooth yet rigid camera turn when Michael pins his victim. The brandishing of the knife showing off the amazing lighting here. And then just this still image of Michael admiring his kill, showing off this amazing cinematography. And I do understand there's some people that might think I ruined the scene by over explaining it, but that's not the intention. The intention is to show how layered this is with being a slasher move. How something as simple as a kill can be shown to be more than the sum of its parts with some nice camera work and acting. With a cherry on top of a haunting mask, which was actually a William Shatner mask, it goes to show that sometimes iconic symbols can come from absolutely nothing or no budget whatsoever. Which is a theme for the rest of the movie as it was filmed on a very minimalistic budget. But rather than John Carpenter using it as an excuse to be lazy, he used it as an excuse to be more intimate, to give it a much more contained, homey feeling. Making this feel like this could happen to you, complimenting Michael once again. And it helps that thanks to the down-to-earth feeling of this, we're able to get a nice protagonist against Michael, that being Dr. Loomis. Feeling a sense of responsibility for making Sir Michael faces justice or gets killed. And what helps that they cast in an old actor to give him a sense of ruggedness to him. A sense that this man has lived a long life, one full of people like Michael and wants nothing more than to bring Michael to justice by any means necessary. Constantly calling Michael a monster, and in a sense he's not wrong. Because besides all the things I said earlier about Michael, what complements it also is John Carpenter's score. John Carpenter made all the music for his own movie, and he honestly has a gift for making amazing music. Making obvious music like the Halloween theme, which I've been playing throughout this whole review just because it's such an iconic theme. It's not disturbing, but it's definitely haunting. And if Michael and everything surrounding him is the main soul of the movie and Dr. Loomis is the brain of the movie, then in my opinion the heart is our survival girl, that being Laurie Strode, who doesn't act and talk like a lot of the other girls who say totally way too many times. Seriously, I love this movie, but that shit got annoying. It doesn't take away from the fact that Lois Strode is still an amazing survivor girl, probably one of the best in my opinion. She's basically the ultimate teenager. She has the sweetness and sincerity we see in a teenager, yet at the same time, she's not exactly a pure angel either. She's a fully developed and realized character, unlike so many other survivor girls in these movies. You feel bad for her, you want her to get out of there, and you want her to survive against Michael. What helps is the fact that she was basically labeled the Scream Queen by her iconic scream. That scream basically basically is her character and I mean that in the best way possible and it all comes to a head when we get to the climax of the movie and I am now gonna spoil the movie so if you want to see it for yourself stop this video and go to this time card or watch the movie then come back and finish this review. Once again I'm about to spoil the ending rotten you have been warned. After Michael kills a rather myriad of teenagers he finally comes to Lori and tries to kill her. But Lori is a survivor girl and she does not go down without a fight. At one point stabbing Michael with a straightened out coat hanger and removing his mask. One of the only times the facade of this humanoid not human is actually broken. And even after when Lori thinks she's finally gotten him, he rises up in an almost zombie-like manner as if to say he's not done, taking whatever facade that was lost in that moment and bringing it back with that one iconic movement, which is broken for the last and final time when Michael is finally killed by being shot to death and even falls off the balcony from the second floor of the building they've been in. And to everyone, it feels like it's over. Michael's finally dead and they can rest. Or so it would seem until we look back to see Michael's corpse is gone. Possibly one of the best endings to a horror movie ever, showing that Michael is still out there and that he could be coming for you. And yeah, granted there was a sequel that would eventually wrap up the Michael Myers story, and while it's good in its own right, in my opinion, just watch the first one. Because the first one is honestly such a masterclass on how to do horror right, and in my opinion why it's easily the best movie to get you into horror. 
And I want that because I think horror movies get a bad reputation. Yeah, some people write them off as just schlocky or just straight up torture porn, but they can convey the entire human emotion. So this Halloween season, as the night starts to go down, pop in this movie with some popcorn under the blankets, and then once the movie's over, look out onto your neighborhood, out into the darkest night, and you'll realize that horror and scares can be so much more when it's on Halloween night.